Welcome to Inside Analog Photo. I'm your host, Scott Shepard. The Inside Analog Photo radio program is all about the traditional photographic process. We talk about all aspects of analog photography, including the hybrid workflow. You can find out more information over at www.insideanalogphoto.com. And of course, Inside Analog Photo is brought to you by Fujifilm, making life more colorful. These guys have the coolest instant photography materials known to mankind. They have, of course, the pack film and three and a quarter by four and a quarter and four by five, color and black and white. They have the Instex systems in the wide format, the Instex 210 camera and film, and of course, the Instex Mini in the Instex Mini 7 and the Instex Mini 25, both in color film. Beautiful stuff. There's nothing cooler than instant photography. You get a print because if you don't have a print, you don't have a real photograph. This is great fun stuff. This is great for art. This is great for business. This is cool stuff. You definitely want to check them out over at www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional, making life more colorful. Our friends over at Photo Publicist, providing worldwide publicity, strategic promotion, social media marketing, and business development for the photographer, turning photographers into celebrities. You can find out more information over at www.photopublicist.com. Our friends at Richard Photo Lab for the highest quality work known to mankind anywhere on this planet. Unbelievable developing, scanning, and of course, output on high quality Fuji Crystal Archive. Unbelievable cool stuff these guys are up to. And remember, you don't have a photograph unless you have a print in your hand and you need to print your pictures. This is important. You need to supply proofs to your customers and even print your own work because it's not about looking at it on a monitor. It's about holding a print in your hand. Definitely check these guys out at Richard Photo Lab, of course at richardphotolab.com. Our friends over at DR5, DR5 Chrome, black and white, developing that turns your black and white neg into, that's right, black and white chrome. Unbelievable stuff, www.dr5.com. Our friends over at Upstrap at upstrap-pro.com for the camera strap that will not slip off your shoulder, guaranteed bar none, the coolest strap around. Our friends at Iger Studios for the finest quality drum scans known to mankind, Iger Studios. Dot com. Our official media partner, APUG, the analog photography user group for all things traditional photographic process on the web, www.apug.org. And our official philanthropic partner, George Eastman House, International Museum of Photography and Film, over at www.eastmanhouse.org. Today on Inside Analog Photo Radio Program, we're going to have with us Ron Mowry. That's right, photo engineer from APUG, talking about how to design your own developer. We're going to talk about development, what's going on now, things to look for, what to do. It's a lot of cool stuff about black and white film development. Ron, how are you doing today? Just fine, Scott. How are you? Good, buddy. Thanks for joining us back on the program here. Always glad to have you with us and talking about all cool things, analog photography. I'm very happy to do it. I love to pass on as much as I can to the next generation of analog photographers. You always do, buddy. Today, let's talk about black and white development There's different ways to develop black and white film. There's ways that you can design your own developer. We're going to talk about all kinds of cool stuff today about development and these chemicals and what this stuff does and how it works. Yeah, we'll talk about that. And I hope we have a chance sometime in the future to talk about color developers and reversal processes and fixers and bleaches and so forth, because that was pretty much what I did for a number of years. No, and I think a lot of people are confused when they get into developing their own black and white film, because I think people start off with doing black and white before they jump into C41 or E6 Mm -hmm. or whatever. So maybe you can explain to us, Ron, why there's so many different developers and how this stuff really works so people can sort of get a grasp on why and what. Okay. First, I have to say that a color developer and a black and white developer have a totally different design philosophy. And I'm not going to talk about color developers today, except to say that there are so many complex layers and chemicals in color that you can only design a film or paper to go through one specific developer and get the right result. But with black and white materials, you can design hundreds of developers to work with a given film or a hundred films to work with a given developer. So black and white and color are totally different. And I've had a lot of questions from people privately and on APUG and PhotoNet about how do you design a developer? What do you worry about? What should you be concerned about? 
I guess the first thing I can say is this. If somebody comes running to me and says, I've just designed a developer and it gives the most gorgeous results, and they show me some terrific, let's say, 8x10s from 4x5, I'm going to say to them, what did it look like with D76 or HC110 or Microdoll X or one of the Ilford developers? All of these are possible checks against their work. And if they haven't run any test with any other developer but their own, how do we know that their super good result is great? All we've got is an 8x10 print from a 4x5. In fact, I'd be justified in asking them, well, does it work with 35 millimeter film? The same type of film, but how does it stand up to enlargement? What if the edge effects, the sharpness, the grain were terrible and it didn't show up in a small enlargement, but killed a big enlargement? So these are some of the things that I ask myself right up front. If a person designs a developer, that's all well and good, but did they achieve the right speed, the right contrast, the right grain, the right sharpness? How does it stand up to magnification, and how does it compare with a well-known substitute? Ron, why would you want to make your own developer, and I guess even more so, why is there so many different developers to start with? Well, Kodak has published a chart that shows that there are three basic things, speed, grain, and sharpness. And you can get any two of those in a given developer and sacrifice the third one. And every developer for black and white that's out there is designed around that triad of parameters, speed, grain, and sharpness. So, for example, if you lose a stop in speed, you can get terrific grain and sharpness out of developer A. You can gain all kinds of speed, but your sharpness or grain may go bad. So you have all of these developers out there to pick and choose from. And they work better or worse with different films. So let's stick with a common thread on this question. So let's say I'm shooting T-Max 400, and Kodak makes T-Max Developer, right? Yeah. Wouldn't I want to use T-Max Developer with the film made by the same guy that makes the developer? That is probably reasonable because I would say that most likely T-Max film is released from Kodak after testing in T-Max Developer. So Kodak knows all about how it responds in T-Max Developer. Now, I also happen to know that they do test products in D76. So there's at least two funnels, if you will, that the T-Max film will go through before it goes out the door. And they have engineers at Kodak that could probably tell you what developer it went through if somebody returned a sample to them. So yes, the film and the developer are optimized at some point to fit together. That doesn't mean that another developer isn't as good. It just means that it's not the optimum. Now, is all this what we would say optimum? all subjective depending on who's looking at it and how the workflow and what you're doing with it is? Or is there a scientific exact that says, okay, well, this is optimum based off of some preset ISO standard or something? Okay, first off, there are ISO standards. And if Kodak says we have ISO 100, it has to fit into that standard or they can't claim it. But apart from that, it's very common for people to mistake, for example, sharpness for contrast. A high contrast developer or a high contrast film subjectively appears sharper to the human eye than a low contrast film that actually has higher sharpness. So Kodak, I know, tests the film both ways. They test it scientifically to come up with a numeric value for speed, sharpness, and grain. But then they make hundreds upon hundreds of pictures and give them to customers and employees alike to evaluate. And we'd sit on panels and select which pictures we thought were better for sharpness and so forth. And if it turns out that a film looks sharper, even if it isn't, that may be better for sales than the other way around. What's the correct test method to say, I like this developer with this film, or if you want to do your own test, I mean, should you shoot Air Force resolution charts, gray tag, Macbeth, color charts? I mean, what is the correct nomenclature or the right way to do photographic tests? I mean, yeah, you can go out and shoot some trees or maybe shoot a picture of your wife or kids or you can do a portrait. But what's really the right way to test these things and have the correct criteria that when you're taking a test photo for a film test, to be able to say this is correct and it is sharper and it's not sharper? Well, there are a couple of ways you can go about it, but the easiest way is to start out by shooting some scenes with a mixture of images. 
such as a building with a flat white or gray background, so you can look at grain. A forest scene with lots of detail, with leaves and patterns and everything, so you can look at highlights and shadows. And you can also look at a Macbeth color checker. And this is even true of black and white film, because you want to see what the color gradation is like. You might shoot someone with gaudy clothes on, people with different complexions to see how they show up. A freckle-faced redhead is a very difficult subject. African Americans have very complex skin structures that they can see and we Caucasians tend to ignore. This is a very difficult subject, but anyhow, a person can go about it that way. And what they would generally do is to shoot one exactly as the manufacturer specifies and process it as they specify. So if it's ISO 100, shoot it at 100. If it's daylight, shoot at daylight. And if it's to be processed for eight minutes in D76 as the recommended developer, do it. So here's another one for you, now that you're talking about shooting it as it calls for. So T-Max 400, TMY 3200, we're just talking about Kodak right now, and it could be anybody. It could be a Neopan 1600, it could be Ilford HP4. I shoot Ilford a lot. So here's a question. They say, oh, this is 100-speed film. Well, a lot of people shoot it at 25 or 400. So the question is, black and white has such a large range that it actually works with. It seems to throw another mess into the mix because you can develop it differently using a different developer to change the rating of the speed. So what's really true? Is there anything when it comes to black and white that has any truth at all to it? Yes. That comes as the second part of my answer to you. The first thing you do is what I said before. Exactly as the manufacturer describes for development, shooting conditions, and everything. Then start to fit the film into your workflow, your techniques, as far as speed and scenery goes, and see if it performs as good or better with different conditions. So you may find that under the way you're shooting the film, ISO 25 might be better than ISO 100, so you're grossly overexposing it, but then you underdevelop it and you get a lot finer grain or something like that. You see what I'm saying? Right. And so from the base point on, you have this wide open window that you can go towards to look for something better. Now, in point of fact, it would be very nice to compound a developer that would work for all films under all conditions. That is difficult, but possible. I've got ideas along that track myself, but since it's very, very difficult to do, and it takes a lot of time and burns a lot of film, as you might imagine, I haven't undertaken any film developer compounding lately. I've been mostly concentrating on paper developers, because they're much simpler to compound than film developers. Do you find that there is even a need to try to develop any more different film developers because there's already so many out there and there's so many formulas for what people have tried, or do you find that there's still a need for something better? There is a need for something better. I'll give you an example. How would you like a developer that just won't quit, that you can just keep running film or paper through and it keeps its activity up? It lasts and lasts. Some developers, like the infamous Xtal, are famous for dying very unpredictably, right? Right, they just go away really quick especially right in the middle of developing something they do. Yes, exactly. That's typical of Ascorbate developers. I've heard rumor that Kodak claimed they could do better with the developer, but I have no proof one way or the other, except to say that about the time Xtal was first compounded and released, they had a lot of packaging problems with it. They had a lot of infant death with the developer freshly mixed growing bad. It was about 88, if I remember rightly. They were about ready to close down the black and white R&D effort pretty much in terms of developers, fixers, and stuff like that, because they felt that there might be a glut on the market with black and white chemistry. So they started to cut back on the work. But there is a lot to do yet for speed, grain, and sharpness in film developers, overall for capacity of developers, and also for pollution. Now, on that latter, that's pretty hard. I've entered dialogue with a number of people about the pollution factor. Let's take two developers, one that has very high capacity, but it also is not environmentally friendly, and another one that has very low capacity, but is very environmentally friendly. One you dump every hour, and the other one you dump every month. 
the one that you're dumping every month is not environmentally as friendly. Actually, when you look at the total demand on the environment, the total biological oxygen and chemical demand, you might find that they come out to be equal. Or the less environmentally friendly developer is actually better than one that's touted to be environmentally friendly, simply because you have to use more of one than the other. Is there even such a thing as environmentally friendly developer? All developers are going to be unfriendly. The reason is very simple. They're alkaline and they consume oxygen from the water supply. So when they're dumped in, they are reductants, they are oxidized, and oxygen, which feeds fish, which feeds bacteria, which feeds aquatic life of all sorts, is consumed. Now, isn't there a way to treat this somehow with something that's not so alkaline to bring the pH level back to 6.4 or whatever the standard pH is? Yeah, you're right. But if you've been reading the posts, for example, on APUG, very many people have gone away from stop baths. And so there is no balancing force. If you use an alkaline fix, a stop bath, and a developer, and then you dump them together, you're essentially neutralizing the alkaline part of my argument. Why would you stop using a stop bath? People have gotten the impression that a stop bath causes pinholes. That's not true. To go back through this, first off, I'll say that a lot of people use borate developers. As a bottom line, borate is a very harmful chemical all by itself to citrus fruits. This is why in the 60s, Kodak was trying to get away from borate developers at the request of the citrus industry in both Florida and California. And so we changed over all of our current color processes from borate to carbonate. I believe about 1970 the change went into effect. There are many things in developers that are not good, and yet people still use them and say, oh, these are great, they're not very harmful. But it depends on where you're located, too, in some cases. In any event, yes, you can get rid of the polluting factor by dumping a stop bath along with an alkaline fix and an alkaline developer or a little more dilute stop bath and an acid fixer or a neutral fixer and developer. If you dump them together, they're going to neutralize each other, and then all you're going to have is the oxygen demand of the reducing agents in the fixer and in the developer. And the sewage treatment plant generally takes care of that by bubbling oxygen through it. So that pretty much takes care of it. Okay, so now that we've been able to figure out how we can make ourselves green, Let's go back to this whole development thing about making a new developer. Why would someone want to even do this? I mean, like you said, you think there's better. You would think that with the black and white developer or how people have been developing black and white film for, I'm sure, more than 100 years now or close to it. I don't know when the first black and white commercially available acetate-backed film was released, but it's been a long time. You would figure by now they would have nailed it. Okay. I don't know why anybody would want to compound their own developer except for satisfaction because I have yet to see somebody prove that it's better than anything that's on the market at the present time. Now, if people live in areas where it's difficult to get photographic processing solutions but easy to get some of the chemicals, then I'm all for it. I myself, when I started designing some developers here, didn't start with a film developer. I started with a print developer because it's easier to do and because also I knew some technology which would extend the lifetime and capacity of the developer. The same is true for a film developer. I can do the same for a film developer, but I know that this technology has not been published, it has not been patented, and therefore it's free for use, but nobody out there seems to be aware of it. Well, now's your chance to patent this quick. No, because it's already been used in products. But that precludes it being patented, you see? Right. Just as a side note, you must have something in a patent application in front of the U.S. Patent Office before the first product using the technology goes on sale. And I might add that you have your name on many a patents. Fifteen, I think. That's a fair amount, yeah. Including Kodachrome, yeah. 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 Designing a developer, just to get into the criteria, for a print developer and a film developer, They're totally different. I've seen people wanting to use D76 for prints. D76 has high sulfite to be a silver halide solvent to get better grain and so on and so forth. The interesting thing is that if you put a high chloride paper into that, 
I have seen as much as one to two stops in speed lost because of the solvent action of the sulfite. So D76 can be sudden death for print papers. So you don't mix the two. One of the very few examples of where you can use a print developer for film is Dettol. It was designed back in the 40s or whatever to be a universal metal hydroquinone developer for film and paper. It was sold, I believe, at one time under the name Universal MQ from Kodak. I'm not sure of that, but I've heard some people say that's true. So I would start out by saying to people, start with what's tried and true. You're going to need sulfite and alkali, perhaps an antifragant, and you're going to need at least one or two developing agents. And as Grant Hayes says, if you need three, you've done something wrong. So you need one or two developing agents, probably not three. One other caution is this. I have found that the so-called standard solutions of alkali and sulfite very often don't mix up to the same pH. And so I suggest that you buy a pH meter and adjust your developer to an exact pH every time, or you're going to start to get variability in your process. You're going to get different results every time, and you're going to wonder why. Why did this happen? Why did that happen? So now I'll mention some alkalis and things like that. You can use borate. The good point is that it makes nice, mild solutions between pH 9 and around 10.2 or 10.3, nice buffered solutions. The bad point is that it's harmful to citrus fruits. The next one is carbonate. You can use sodium or potassium carbonate. The next one is phosphate. You can use sodium or potassium phosphates. They tend to make very high contrast developers, very active ones, because the pH is generally going to be around 11 or higher. There are two criteria that you have to be aware of. You have to be aware of pH and buffer capacity. I can make a solution of 5 grams of sodium borate and 50 grams of sodium borate at pH 10.0. They will both have the same pH. They will both have the same initial result in development, but one will exhaust faster than the other with a given amount of film because the buffer capacity is too low. At 5 grams per liter of borate, the developer will exhaust rapidly. Although, on the other hand, it will give you some very interesting effects in D-max areas as buffer is exhausted by the development action. So there are pros and cons. You have to consider all of this as you design your developer. And you have to test for all of it. You see how complex a situation it can be, Scott? Well, sure, because you change one little thing with this buffer, the way this runs, and you go out and shoot another 10 rolls of film, and then develop in that developer and start analyzing all this information you have. It's like data overload. Yeah, generally, I find to fully test a set of developers, I'm going to need about, well, this was five years ago, I would need about $100 worth of film. Recently, film's gone up so much in price, it would probably cost about $200 to test a given set of developers adequately. I would shoot one roll of film for the reference and run it through D76, and then I'd shoot the rest of those rolls in that $200 sample for the different developer variations. And I wouldn't just shoot one kind of film either. I'd shoot Tri-X, I'd shoot HP4, Delta, half a dozen different kinds of film, which starts to run the price up too. Well, exactly. Do you think that with the right development, you can come up with a developer that would be even superior than what's available today? I'm inclined to say yes. From right now where I am and the experiments I've run, it would probably take me one year about $200 worth of film and about 100 to $200 worth of chemicals to do. Is it I economically would... feasible to do this? Would people actually buy it or do they just want the formula and so they want you to do the work for free? Well, <laughs> actually, that has happened. To be honest with you, I've had a number of people ask me for the formulas for all these developers and fixers that I'm working on. And I say, hey, look, it's cost me a couple of hundred dollars to develop this. What are the people going to do that want to go out and buy it from a place that wants to manufacture it? Or how can I sell it or give it to any other company if somebody else is willing to give it to them? I don't want to be selfish about it, and I don't want to be restrictive, but I'd just as soon give it to somebody like the formulary or Digital Truth and give it away freely. Because, you see, those places deserve to stay in business. You know what I'm saying? 
How would we suffer if we could no longer buy photochemicals from places like Digital Truth and the formulary? Well, you could go after commercial chemical suppliers, but then they're going to think that you're manufacturing drugs, probably. Exactly. <laughs> I went through this recently with Cole Palmer. I tried to buy some Tigon tubing for emulsion-making pumps. They refused categorically to sell me anything. No, just Tigon tubing. I finally had to go through an intermediate company, and they were able to get it for me. But they had to explain that I was uh, DEA-approved and this and that and the other thing. I cannot buy anything but simple spatulas and just odds and ends from Ward Scientific. I can drive over to Ward's headquarters from my home, and I can place a big order there, but not one single chemical, nothing. Just odds and ends, miscellaneous lab stuff, and even that is rather restricted. I had a friend try to buy a three-neck flask. I'm trying to remember what it was for. He tried to buy a three-neck flask, and he was refused. So... Well, I guess the thing is, all these supply houses figure, okay, well, you want to buy a flask or a 20-foot roll of tubing, and for them, with the man breathing down their back so hard, it's not worth them to even sell you anything. They're just like, goodbye, go away. That's true. I've talked to people at some of these small chemical supply houses, and they tell me that they are regularly inspected by the FBI and Homeland Security, DEA, whatever agencies are interested, and spotlight them that particular week. And they'll come in and have to open their records to the inspecting organizations. So, yes, it's becoming a very, very restrictive situation. So back to the point, that's why it's cool that these guys are selling business like the formulary and so forth and so on, because they'll sell you stuff to develop your black and white film or even your color film or whatever you want. That's right. And I think that if everybody went out to mix their own chemicals, very gradually, you would see places like the Formulary, Digital Truth, and other places that sell photochemicals just disappear one by one by one. Because you buy a, a one-pound bottle of Metol, it's going to last you maybe a year, two years. In the meantime, those companies aren't getting any sales. But if you buy a gallon kit of developer every other month, it's going to keep them going. And they're going to have better turnover in their product, too. So everybody's going to get a better deal because they get fresh product. Yes, and you can see what's happened. Kodak has cut back rather drastically on the production of their chemicals. In fact, they've sold the rights to manufacture the chemicals under the Kodak name to Champion Chemical Company, which now runs the Powders and Solutions division at Kodak. So when you buy Kodak Developer that's a powder or a solution or even a bottle, liquid chemical, it all comes from Champion. It's really not even Kodak anymore. It's coming from Kodak Park. It's coming from the original Kodak equipment, as I understand it, but it's managed by Champion. I may be mistaken, but that's my understanding. Nevertheless, people should support the people that make the product they use instead of trying to make their own. I guess the point would be, where would you proceed on making a new developer? What's the key point that you find that people need with a fresh developer? Is it going to be the longevity? Is it going to be how green the product is? Is it going to be that it's going to be sharper with better contrast with this? What's the biggest factor you find right now, Ron, that's going to be the key point to say, okay, I'm going to go do this? Well, first off, I'm going to work on a developer that has great longevity or great capacity or some intermediate combination of them both. Secondly, I'm going to try and get the best speed, grain, and sharpness out of it. So those will be my criteria to give the customer something better. Pretty much HC-110 approaches that better than most on the market today, I think. Although there are a lot of others that do just as well. I'm trying to get some ideas here to present. You see, HC-110 was Kodak's idea of making a very concentrated, long-lived syrup. And to do that, they had to go through some very weird chemical tricks to do it. They start out with triethanolamine and diethanolamine, and they pump sulfur dioxide gas and hydrogen bromide gas into it so that they don't create any extraneous precipitatable salts. They actually form the salt out of the alkali in the absence of water. And so the minute you add water, you get sodium sulfite and sodium bromide, so to speak. So they've gone through all these chemical tricks to make these enormously concentrated syrups like HC-110. And that's something I just can't do. So I'm wondering, how close can I get? It's going to be fun to try. 
I'm poised to start that, but I have about another two months of emulsion experiments to do. You see, my darkroom is set up so that I can only do process experiments or emulsion experiments, not both. And so right now I'm doing emulsion experiments. And as soon as I'm finished with a tea grain and a high iodide emulsion, then I have to strip down the darkroom, clean it up, and convert over to solution development work. What do you find is the biggest request that people are looking for from you? Do they want to see the emulsion work? Do they want to see this development, paper development? What's the biggest request that you're getting for your time? (laughs) Oh, Scott, if you (laughs) only knew. They want everything now. And they want it all for free. (laughs) Well, some do, some don't. But, yeah, they want everything right now. Why isn't the book done? Why aren't the DVDs done? Why aren't the developers done? We're Superfix. What about TF5? Well, I can tell you, Bud is working hard on improvements to Liquidol and the TF5. We're working on ways to improve the Superfix for a variety of reasons, which I shouldn't get into discussion right now. I'm working on the book. The DVDs are done, and I have a half a dozen copies of them sitting here. The book, when read by a couple of people, they said, why don't you add this? Why don't you add that? So I'm adding three additional sections. I've added some alternative information on mixers. I've added information on pump making. And now I'm going to be working on a tea grain. So basically, it's wrapped up. It's just that I can't do everything at once. There's only one of me. And I'm working hard like a one-armed paper hanger in a windstorm, as I used to say. (laughs) Do you remember that old saying? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So let's talk about some of these other developers that people have been buzzwording here lately. There's a big buzz going on right now with this whole calf and all deal. Yeah, well, calf and all is fun to play with. If I might add, Grant Haste has said you can make such a thing as wine all, <laughs> which uses burgundy wine. He has made Genesee River all by going down to the river here in Rochester and taking a flask of river water, and he's been able to develop film in that. And one which he does not recommend to anybody, but it would be affectionately called urinal. I'll leave that to your imagination. So here's the thing. I mean, what's the biggest deal to make this stuff work? I mean, it seems Uh, that you can develop black and white film in literally anything. Strong coffee and washing soda. And you will develop film, depending on the strength of the coffee and soda, it will take you about 15 to 30 minutes to develop a decent negative. What actually develops it? What's this process that happens with either strong coffee or these other alkalines and chemicals and all these other developers? I mean, what actually goes on when you pour this stuff in? Well, there are a number of alkaloids in the coffee or wine or even orange juice, which contains vitamin C, which is ascorbic acid. Any one of those is what's called a reducing agent. When that reducing agent hits exposed silver, the reducing agent is oxidized, and the exposed silver halide is reduced to silver metal and forms a black image. And it's just as simple as that. One chemical goes one way, and another chemical goes the other way in chemical state. And the result is a visible image. And if you control it properly with alkali, sulfite, antifogant, all of these other ingredients, they will help modify that image to give better or worse grain, higher or lower contrast, and so on. So if you took, for example, cathanol, and instead of using washing soda, you used lye, you would get much higher contrast and more rapid development. Now, I don't recommend lye because of its extreme toxicity and caustic effects on human skin and eyes, but that's a typical example. If you increase or reduce the amount of carbonate in caffeinol, you'll change the contrast higher or lower, you'll change the edge effects and all of the other things. You can repress edge effects by adding an antifogant. You can increase edge effects by decreasing antifogant or decreasing the buffer capacity of the developer. Basically, it's a trial and error for almost any film because each film is going to react differently because of the different iodide levels in the film. The higher the iodide, the more the edge effect. If you add iodide to the developer, it acts like an iodide buffer and represses edge effects. And so you can play around with sharpness. And you say, gee, i got a great developer, and then you change to a low iodide film, and it's so flat and unsharp, you can't believe it. So there you are. You see the problem, Scott? Sure. 
You've got to know or appreciate some degree of chemistry to design a film developer. And I guess I just have to leave it at that. I would recommend that people stick with carbonate or triethanolamine. I'd recommend they stick with sulfite and bromide. I'd recommend that they avoid iodide. I'd suggest ascorbic acid, hydroquinone, metol, paraminophenol, any number of black and white developing agents, dimazone, phenidone, things like that. Those are all possible developing agents. I guess that's about all I can say offhand without getting into specific formulas. But if I gave you one, I wouldn't know if it would work or not. So let's talk about this. Let's look at the current state of analog photography. And maybe this is more of a recommendation. And there's a lot of people now that don't have the knowledge, the whereabouts, the money, or the room to have an optical darkroom. So they like to shoot black and white film. But I have a separate question on that here in a minute. But let's say you do shoot traditional black and white film. You can soup the stuff yourself, and then you're going to scan it. Is there a better developer that you've seen for the scanning process over another? What's your recommendation for people that want to do traditional black and white work, but then enter this into a hybrid workflow? Goodness, that depends on the film right? and the developer. I would say any Ilford, Kodak, or Fuji film is good. I am most experienced with Kodak developers, and so I would say HC-110 or D76. Those are two excellent developers, but I know that Ilford developers are equally as good. It's just that they're very much harder to get here for me. I would say follow the manufacturer's instruction for a film developer combination and see if it suits you. I would buy a small changing bag, a stainless steel reel and tank, put the film on the reel in the changing bag, and then develop it in your kitchen or bathroom sink or bathtub in a plastic tray, though, so that you don't splash stuff onto the porcelain or the stainless steel. And then fix and wash and dry in a lint-free space. And if you want to see your photographs up in bright light, scan them and post them on APUG or someplace like that, PhotoNet. That's the way I'd go. Do you find that more and more people are going this direction? Well, to be frank with you, it's getting so hard to get paper, especially color paper, in cut sheets that I see a lot of people just scanning their negatives and using them on their computer. And if family and friends want them, they either send them to family and friends via email or make prints on their printer and give them to whoever asks for them. That's the way it seems to be going. It's getting very difficult to get black and white processed at local stores, if not impossible. I myself don't recommend and do not use the C41 black and white films. They end up being processed and printed sometimes on color paper, and I just don't like the result. Always, to me, they seem to have a little bit of a color tint to them. So I kind of stay away from them. And also, because you're forming a black dye in this film, the dye is not permanent, just like all dyes. It will say that right on the box, I believe. So I don't offhand recommend the BW, I think it's called CN. The 400 CN. Yeah. In fact, I have a box of it here. I'm just looking to see if it says, these dyes, like all dyes, will fade. But it doesn't have one of those on this. So, oh, there it is, the notice on the side. Photo tips inside. I can't even read anymore. I'm getting so blind. I'm blind in one eye and can't see out of the other. (laughs) (laughs) That's a problem. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I'm putting on my reading glasses to see if I can read it. I can't read here what it says. Well, I guess the key thing is with this, okay, so let me bring this into the mix here with the BW400C and Kodak product that is basically non-existent now in medium format. Can I just shoot 400 NC and just do a quick conversion because it's going to be hybrid probably anyway? Aren't I going to get the same toe and heel and my curve's going to be almost identical? Yes, you are. That film, the BW400 film, has exactly the same curve as Protocolor 400 film and uh, will yield very nice results if you just want to scan it in, turn it into black and white on a computer screen, and then print it digitally or scan it and post it on a website. But if you want to make sure your film lasts for posterity, this film probably won't be as hardy as a good silver-only black and white film. Right. So that's my only concern. As I say, I don't use the BW, the C41 process films myself, 
because of this very concern of mine. By the way, that brings up another thing. A lot of people like to use developers that impart, oh, shall we say, a mask or a um, colored image to the film. These are the catacol type or pyro type developers that we haven't even mentioned yet. They, too, form a dye in your coding, and there's no evidence at all about the longevity of the dye that's formed. So I can't give you an opinion. All I can do is say it is a dye that's being formed, and no dye is infinitely stable. So for pyro developers, any one of those that create a tone to the silver image that forms, for whatever reason, for sharpness or better shadow or highlight detail, there can be a long-term keeping problem. I don't know. Nobody's ever run tests on them as far as I know. Why would you want to do that? I mean, besides, like you said, maybe the staining developer brings out some more detail, but then you have a color cast. So why would I even want to use a pyro-based, some staining developer over a traditional one? Well, I don't use them myself. I've seen some very beautiful prints made using these negatives. But on the other hand, I've found them very difficult to print from. I've had friends give me some and ask me to make prints for them, and I have gone to great lengths to try and get prints, and it's been extremely difficult because it's a difficult technique to master. And since I don't play with it often, it's very difficult to judge, particularly since some of that image is in the ultraviolet region and spread across the visible spectrum. And so it's hard for a human being to pick up the negative, look at it, and say, oh, this is a grade so-and-so contrast negative, and it's going to take approximately this much exposure. It always fools me when I look at a stain negative. So take that for what it's worth, too. There you go. Ron, where can people find out about what you're up to? Is the best place to go to APUG? Where can they find out about development, black and white processes? I think next time we're going to chat here about some other chemicals and paper developers and other things that you're up to. But in the meanwhile, where can they find out about what you're up to and where you're hanging out? Oh, I'm usually found on APUG, on Photonet, and I frequent AIM sometimes. I've been doing it less and less because I've been doing more and more here and have less and less time to sit around and idly chat. So, Ron, the best way to contact you, I guess, is over at APUG then, correct? That's so, or they can send me an email. My email is on APUG, so all you have to do is click on my name. And you can either send me a private message or you can send me an email, which is actually much more convenient. I answer all messages. I never neglect a message from anyone. So feel free. Of course, Ron, great work. You're really a huge asset to the analog and film-based communities, and this is cool stuff you're doing. And, of course, we always look forward to having you back on the program here very soon. We're going to chat about development and chemicals and processes and all this great stuff you're doing, buddy. And I appreciate you taking the time today to join us. This is cool stuff. Well, I was perfectly happy to do it. Got to pass it on somehow, Scott. Ron, thanks so much, buddy. Thank you. Take Hold care. On. Well, there you go. Ron Mowry, our buddy Ron, photo engineer over at APUG. And, of course, you can find out what Ron's up to over at APUG at www.apug.org. The Inside Analog Photo Radio Program has been brought to you by Fujifilm for their full line of instant cameras and film. And, of course, fine quality Fuji Crystal Archive paper over at www. FujifilmUSA.com forward slash professional. Our friends at Photo Publicist, Worldwide Publicity, Strategic Promotion, Social Media Marketing, and Business Development over at www.photopublicist.com. Our friends at Richard Photo Lab for the finest quality lab in the country, RichardPhotoLab.com. Our friends over at DR5 for black and white chrome at DR5.com. Upstrap for the finest quality camera strap that will not slide off your shoulder at upstrap-pro.com. Our friends over at Iger Studios at igerstudios.com. And, of course, our media partners of the Analog Photography User Group at apug.org. And our official philanthropic partner, George Eastman House, over at eastmanhouse.org. I've been your host, Scott Shippard, here on Inside Analog Photo. We'll be back next week with more great analog photography.